Hi, everyone. Today's stream, we are talking about the art world and sexism. If you are looking to strengthen and flex your art muscle, Art Prof is a community for you. We have tutorials, critiques, and more, and they're all for free. We also are rolling out three upcoming premium tracks. Clara, would you like to talk a little bit about that? Yes, the registration deadline is on Friday. So you've got 48 hours to register for these premium tracks. We are going to be offering color, drawing basics, and also portraiture. And this is your opportunity to work closely with the Art Prof staff. We are having so much fun with the current premium tracks. So go to artprof.org. The link is in the YouTube video description below to get more information and to register. All right, let's talk about sexism in the art world. I believe between the three of us, Deepti and Lauren, we've got a lot of stories to tell. <laughs> So let's start with one which is fairly simple, but interesting how big it can get, which is, Deepi, your name has actually been something where you've noticed sexism. So how does that play out? Yeah, I feel like when I started kind of noticing a difference in how I was treated was kind of after I left college personally, um, or maybe when I started noticing it more frequently. So I started clocking it a little bit more. And a lot of it had to do with when I was freelancing, a lot of communication happens over email. And I noticed that once we turned it into a phone call, people often thought that I was Deep D's assistant or um, that Deep D was a man. And then they started speaking to me very differently. Um, and I just felt like I received a lot more like patronizing comments. And um, it also would translate into like pay sometimes. Um, things would change uh, when people figured out that I was a woman, even though my work didn't change or my portfolio didn't change. Um, so that was just something I started noticing because my name is quite uncommon in the States. Um, and I think a lot of people just assume that I was a man. I don't, I don't know why. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah. It's funny how people change their minds depending on what they find out about you in advance. For example, one thing I noticed when I was at RISD is that you have this whole generation of older men, probably in their sixties and seventies. And I noticed that they would always do this thing where they would basically hire a younger version of themselves. I mean, that's why I was never hired <laughs> because nobody was Asian and female who was in their 60s and 70s on the faculty at RISD. And you would watch that play out, not just in terms of who got hired, but you would go to faculty meeting and you would see the 65-year-old faculty member palling around with the new young male who had just finished their MFA and it just made me want to barf. <laughs> oh dear. And Lauren, academia is the worst for a lot of this stuff. You think at an art school where people are supposed to be creative and open-minded, but that was not the case. You've seen people give people crap about having kids and where have you seen that? Yeah, this was more, yeah, sometimes what I've seen is professors giving critiques to uh, more femme presenting people or people who identify as women uh, saying this, this should be a time when you really focus on your art making because, you know, you won't have this time when you graduate because you're going to have a family, you're going to have kids. And so you really, and you won't get to work on your art anymore. So you should really value this time. And <laughs> this seemed very off to me because this was usually given to, well, often given to these women that were in a relationship with another person in the school or in the department. And the guy in that relationship would not get the same critique. <laughs> and then also this would be just given to someone who they would just expect to go off and have a family because I don't know, they have long hair and they wear makeup or something. And that seems um, not right. I didn't get these same critiques, but I feel like that was very much based off of the way that I look and present. Um, 
which shows that kind of assumptive behavior. Emmy says, this is going to be depressing. Crossing my fingers, I don't get horribly depressed. Well, what do you say about that, Deep Deep? Because sometimes I worry when we have streams like this and we tell our horror stories that it is depressing. Is there a way we can take a more positive spin from this? I mean, the reality is the reality. And like Lauren said, there are, everyone's experiences are very varied. Um, even between the three of us, our experiences are very varied. But I think that talking about it and, and having this discourse is the most important thing because um, there are so many ways that we can, you know, help help combat this. And, and one of the ways is to just talk about it and make sure it's heard. Um, because a lot of times people aren't doing this consciously sometimes it's just like these subconscious biases that people have um so yes it's depressing but that is the reality of the situation and we have a comment from oh no i lost it oh here we go Alyssa that says i wish this was exclusive to the art world i'm an ecologist and unfortunately very similar that's you know another good thing it's like our experiences are in in the art world but i think we're you know opening up a conversation, hopefully, that a lot of people can identify with, because we know for a fact that it's not singular to just the art world. Absolutely. And to continue that conversation about having children, I have a colleague who interviewed for a full-time teaching position in academia, and she has kids, and the people on the committee knew she had kids, and was asked, how are you going to balance being a full-time professor and having a family. First of all, that's illegal. You're not supposed to ask those types of questions. And I know this because I've had friends and colleagues on search committees before, and they're given training to be told, this is what you're allowed to say. You may not say this. This person really should have known better. And my friend was very taken aback. She was very uncomfortable. I don't think a lot of the male candidates who were 26 who did get the job, got asked those questions. And I was just furious because nobody deserves to be spoken to that way in an interview. And Lauren, I also think women artists get pigeonholed. How did that happen? Yeah, one, one thing that I worry about a lot in my own artwork is being someone who makes artwork about domestic spaces or spaces that just one lives in because the way that sometimes gets critiqued or talked about is in this, I'm going to call it a diminutive kind of way where people who present as women they they make they make artwork about about oh uh having children or about craft like uh like knitting or or textiles or something that's seen as as lower and it's hard to really put put this into words because it's very gaslighty but there's a way that that is talked about even if you are someone who is them presenting and hangs your work in a certain way. This was actually brought up in a critique recently that I had with another uh, f colleague in my class, and she hung her work, her small work, uh, very close together and was critiqued on how this is very feminine and how th she could get put into this, she should take up more space. And it was very, very sexualized that way. And while we had an open conversation about that and the teacher was actually really wonderful and acknowledged this, still, this is, uh, it's an assumption for people. It's what we immediately go to. A lot of people immediately go to, not just men, but women too, because, and, and people of all genders and across that spectrum, because this is how we're, we're, we're socialized. Yeah. And I mean, the word craft is heavily loaded. People interpret it in so many different ways. And it makes me furious that there's almost this hierarchy that, oh, this is inherently better. This is inherently worse. I'm like, it doesn't work that way. It's case by case. And it's frustrating that a lot of female artists who I've been talking to who do want to make work about motherhood 
are worried that they're not going to be taken seriously. Have you seen that, Deepti? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think that like there is kind of a fear of being pigeonholed or seen as just one thing if you start, you know, making work about your gender or how you present. Um, and then that's the only thing that you are known for or, or um, you know, what you're capable of making. Um, definitely. And I think those fears are something that um, people think about all the time. They, you know, you want as an artist to be able to explore anything, um, but you're nervous about exploring one thing and then that being the only thing. <laughs> Brittany says, I get self-conscious about using pink in my work because I worry it will make me seem less serious, which is just maddening when you think about it. Well, this is not about the artwork, but I did have a student at one point who said that when she wanted to have her final critique at the end of the semester, and it was like in front of three professors or something, she said she would dress down because she said if she showed up at the critique with makeup and her hair done and like in a nice outfit, she said she would get a different critique. She said that the teachers would talk down to her as if she wasn't capable, but if she just like intentionally made herself look not good, then they would treat her with more respect. I'm like, could we be more shallow? I mean, you're in your MFA program right now, Lauren, and you've been in art school. Have you seen students just treated differently because they're dressing a certain way or? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, this goes beyond sexism for sure across all different types of, uh, you know, uh, prejudices, I guess, or assumptions. And I, I think people in the MFA program try to be aware of it, but it still gets beyond us a lot of the time. And it's it causes a lot of tension and a lot of a lot of hard feelings. And it's important to find a way to constructively talk about these things in the classroom and be open about them when they do happen, because otherwise they just fester and fester forever. And the people that bring up these comments don't realize that they are being sexist and don't ever learn. So there's this whole other can of worms that goes with this too, about how do we, how do we work through this together? Well, this is very interesting. A lot of you are sharing experiences in other fields. And Jazz is saying it's true in manufacturing too. If you show up all makeup, you are not taken seriously. And it makes me angry that women have to think about that. That that student even had to think in advance, how am I going to make myself less attractive so I can actually get a decent critique is really infuriating. And Deepti, I know... You and Lauren are younger artists. I'm an old fart. And I think you'll see that young female identifying artists are treated differently. They're seen as, oh, you're so young. I was literally told once when I was 22, I'd just gone to grad, grad school, no, undergrad school. And this gallery owner said to me, you're a baby. I, I'm like, would you say that if I was a male with a big beard and I, I don't know, like why are young female artists seen as like, oh, you're so fragile and inexperienced? I don't know, but I think it also comes down to like when you're talking about pay too. I've seen so many of my female and female identifying, female presenting friends compare salaries with people who are doing the exact same job as they are, who are, are identify as male and, um, it's like kind of a ridiculous discrepancy. And I, and I think that like, yeah, a lot of times these like young male artists are seen as like geniuses and uh, you know, prodigies and stuff. Whereas female identifying artists who are young and right out of school are seen as inexperienced and green. Um, I've seen that so many times. And I think a lot of it might be the subconscious bias because the people who are hiring them or the people who are looking over their resume are a lot of times older men you know who are identifying with these younger men and seeing themselves and feel this kind of like camaraderie there whereas with the women I'm sure there's a bias of like these are just like little baby girls um and and it's awful and and I think also about like when you're in a workplace being labeled like you know with that pay discrepancy being feared that you're you know asking for too much or or being bossy whereas with 
um, people who present as male, a lot of times it's seen as like, you know, strength and like asking for what you deserve and, and taking charge of your career. So it's just a completely double standard. That's, that's ridiculous. Well, Lauren turned 31 yesterday. <laughs> Happy birthday! <laughs> Jordan is Lauren's birthday twin. So if you feel like giving us some birthday super chats, I'm sure that would help Lauren celebrate yes. her birthday. Thanks, and guys. And Lauren, you and I have had this conversation. I told you many years ago when you were in your 20s, I said, listen, your 20s kind of suck from a professional point of view because <laughs> People just say, you're so young, you're so young, they call you a baby. And then you turn 30 and then miraculously, people just give you respect. Not because anything's different, but because you are not 20. Therefore, <laughs> you are somehow better. Have you seen, you've crossed over now, you're, you're in the 30s. Have things changed with how people speak to you now compared to when you were, say, 21? Yes. It's it's hard to really know for sure because I also think that I've really grown since then and I also was a very different person when I was 21. But I do think that moving through the world is just a little bit easier and that's not just in the art world, that's in the medical world or the financial world or in the non-art job world. Any of these things has... I don't know if it's 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 a I guess it has to be age they see the the 30 or the 31 now and they're like oh okay you're an adult whereas all my 20s didn't count <laughs> it's like you're always just a little too young or a little bit too old in the art world I always feel like the sweet spot is 30 to 35 like once oh. you get past oh. 35 your ship starts sailing I, I wrote about this in my Instagram post a little bit, how you only get 10 years in the sun. This is a quote from The Wind Rises, which is a movie by Hayao Miyazaki, which is extremely beautiful. But I feel a deep anxiety about this because it is true that in the painting fine art world where I'm in, in New York, if you are, again, like a female presenting person, you're your sweet spot is between 30 and 35 it feels like and if you don't if you don't get it then you're not gonna get it because artists women artists in their 40s are totally ignored and so i'm making artwork and even though you know i've got my own feelings about who i am and all that stuff but that doesn't necessarily apply to everybody who looks at me in my studio so I do feel that pressure and that feels a little bit unfair because I feel like my male colleagues and peers don't necessarily feel that as much. Well, I have noticed there is this trend with arts writers where women artists, when they're 85, all of a sudden they get this incredible presence and everybody's writing about them and the Guggenheim is doing their retrospective and look at this woman artist, she's 85 and look at what she's done. <laughs> so we basically have to be not 20, but not 40, but wait till we're 85. Why do you think women often have to wait that long, Deep D, to get that recognition? I have no idea. I guess I'll find out when I'm 85, but um, <laughs> I don't, I, I have no idea. I mean, maybe it's because we're not threatening when we're 85. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know. Maybe it's seen like an accomplishment that we persisted that long. Like we should finally get an award. I, I don't, I don't know, but it is ridiculous. It's like at, at both ends of the spectrum, like when you're just starting or you're 85, um, you're still just being seen in a lens that other people are putting on you. It's not really how you want to be seen as an artist. Thank you, Anna. Thank you so much. We greatly <laughs> appreciate your support. Yeah, C. Cantrell says, when you turn 40, you just start to command the respect. I mean, for me, it's more like, screw this, whatever. I'm just going to say whatever, and you all have to deal with it. But yeah, th there is this sort of invisible feel that why are women invisible between these ages? And it kind of makes me mad because a lot of men don't do that. 
I don't know. It's a phenomenon. And I know this because there was an arts writer who wrote an article about how all these women have to wait till they're in their 80s to get those retrospectives. Contemporary Samira saying, oh, no, I'm a female artist who isn't 30. Did my ship just sail? Am I wrong to pursue my dream now? I couldn't do it earlier because life happened. I would say absolutely not. I mean, of course, these biases are going to exist. But I feel like, you know, no matter who you are, there are going to be biases and people are going to look at you in a certain way. And I think it's all about finding your right community and, and making art for the right reasons. And um, there are people like us who are going to cheer you on and support you. And, um, you know, as much as this is still very much present and existing, I do think that the more we talk about it and the more we're open, the more we'll start seeing the landscape shift and change. So definitely don't not participate um, and not follow your dreams because there are absolutely a lot of people out there who will um, support you and cheer you on. I do think social media has changed things. I don't think it's the same landscape that it was even 10 years ago. And I do think that you have a lot of voices that are getting visibility now who even 30 years ago would never have had that opportunity because anyone can get on Instagram. Anybody can get on TikTok. What do you think about that, Lauren? Do you think that's really going to present a shift or is it just going to be all the same crap but online? <laughs> I think... Yeah, this is a hard question, actually. I think that, yes, it does make things easier because you don't have the same types of gatekeepers, which are these, generally speaking, white men who run the institutions or galleries and hire people that look like themselves. The internet doesn't really work that way. At the same time, I think that we carry these structural biases with us when we go online. Like it's hard to get past the human and the systemic uh, sexism and racism and homophobia and what have you that exist. So it it's a place it's it's a place where it's a chance for us to do better right but um we still we still have to work with it jazz is asking do i need to wear a thong to get attention on instagram well hang on that there's something about this so one thing i have noticed because of social media what you look like as an artist matters now in a way it didn't a long time ago it's sort of like Older folks, remember when MTV came out and music videos became a thing? Like in the 60s, nobody cared that much about your like image and your outfits. But then when music videos came out, everybody cared about your clothes and what you look like. And I feel like that's what's happening with artists now. Like, Dee Dee, have you seen artists on Instagram? And you're like, I know why you have a lot of followers. <laughs> and it's not because of your artwork. Yeah, definitely. And I also think it's like who you're associated with, too. Like, um, I've seen groups of artists who are all very sexy and beautiful. And I'm like, hmm, there's definitely like some something going on here. Um, but yeah, I do think that like you as a as a person, um, as a personality has now become an element in um, your your success as an artist. Lauren, I saw you giggling over there. Do you have a story? Yes. about this? There is a guy on TikTok that I follow who makes, who is a potter, a ceramicist, who works on the wheel. <laughs> and he has something like a million followers, you know, very traditionally hot. And I know the reason, I, I just know the reason why he has so many followers and so many views is because when he puts that clay onto the wheel, he slaps it like it's a butt. And then he looks at the camera. <laughs> <laughs> and I know this because his old, his old, his his old videos, he doesn't do this. And then his new videos, his newer videos, anything that has a million views, he does that. And there are more and more of them as it goes up, as you get to the more recent views. Oh, I that mean is so hilarious. I mean, on two sides of things, like one thing, like good for him, like do what you want to do. Yeah. But the other thing is, it kind of. It makes you feel shitty that like that's what you have to do to get get recognition sometimes <laughs> well and here's a point from anna who says instagram can be an equalizer but if you're able-bodied white hot and thin it does make things easier exactly some people have that leg up on the other hand though 
I think if you ask a lot of artists, hey, would you be rather known for being hot or for your artwork? I think most of us would pick the artwork. And I don't know that I'd be very, I mean, not like it's in the cards for me. <laughs> I don't want to slap like Clay or anything. I mean, I'm not going to like reenact like the ghost scene where Demi Moore and Patrick Swayze are like at it. But it, it does make you wonder where where's the line? Where do you draw the line? Because I know there are a lot of women who stream on Twitch in kind of sexy outfits and there's a lot of men that follow them. So I I don't know. It's it's really difficult. Casey says that reminds me of the ever-present paintings of hyper-realistic, pretty naked white women that always get popular on the front page of Reddit. What do you think about that, Lauren? Yeah, that is a thing too, especially right now when we're in a, uh, I'm going to say, figurative uh, boom in the art world where everybody wants to draw a figure or paint a figure. And you're either, the, these, these figures, they, they get objectified and those pretty white women who are naked, they often are the ones that rise to the top. But in the same kind of avenue, I feel like it's very intersectional and all related where also what happens is uh, like black women who are making artwork and they, they feel forced to do figurative kinds of work because that, that body is what, what sells or what is like really hot right now. And that's not what everybody wants to do or what everybody wants to be pigeonholed into doing. Vindictive Tiger says, yes, on Instagram, there are gatekeepers on there. You can submit really great artwork to various accounts. You'll be ignored if you're not hiking their girls up to your chin. I mean, it makes me frustrated that we can't just make great work and that be enough. But unfortunately, when you're working as an artist, the artwork is just one piece of the package. Does that depress you, Deepti, to think about it that way? Yeah, definitely, because I think that you put so much effort into your work um, and so much of yourself is in there to then think on top of that, that you also have to be like presenting in a certain way. And there might just be, you know, if you don't look a certain way, you just will not stand out <laughs> uh, or that your odds are much, much less. Um, that's just really, really sad, because I think regardless, you know, that's something you might not have control over, but your work and your vision is something that you put a lot of effort and you do have a lot of control over. So um, yeah, it kind of makes you feel like your fate is out of your hands. <laughs> Starving Artist says, but are those semi-naked women artists going to be taken seriously as artists when their looks change? There's that and also there's different parts to the art world. I mean, when we were talking about that, oh, you're hot stuff when you're 30 to 35, I mean, that's a very New York mindset i mean it's very different in other fields and other countries and stuff like that but your artwork is always going to be there your looks are going to change obviously everybody does as they get older i mean it's it's kind of depressing that we have to talk about this almost like hollywood where i think it was andy mcdowell i heard in npr interview with her and she said that a reporter actually said to her well, aren't you worried about when you grow older and lose your beauty? I just cannot believe that people ask questions like that to actresses. And yet I do think that for a lot of artists, because the image and the personality is such a big part of who you are now, it makes a big difference. And it's frustrating to be thinking about it that way. Kathy says, notice many popular social media artists usually draw or paint portraits of conventionally attractive celebrities who are mostly white or white presenting. That's true, but that work only goes so far. What do you think, Lauren? I th Well, yeah, I think this exists in all parts of the art world, though, in that it's, yes, it goes so far, but it tends to go further than 
drawing or painting otherwise, which is frustrating. I was thinking recently also about how I see very few pieces of artwork that have, say, um, mobility aids in them as part of a portrait of the artist. I was watching Portrait Artist of the Year. That was it. And... <laughs> Um, nobody, nobody was, there was, there were several rugby players and, and veterans that were in like wheelchairs and nobody drew the wheelchair. They only drew like the face or like the body and like erase the wheelchair, like entirely. And I was like, why, why? That's so awkward. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it was not talked about, but it, I, I think that this goes, this is part of that larger thing of, okay, who gets represented here? I think it still relates to this sexism thing or only showing very beautiful young white women in paintings. It goes the furthest and yeah, it's not great. Brian is asking, did any of you three experience sexual harassment while in university or in the workplace during your art career? I don't think I've had anything physical. I've never had anybody like grab my butt or, you know, attack me. I've never had anything like that happen before, but I have noticed that the people, the students who would go to the Dean to complain about me, they were always male students. I never had female students do that. And I don't think that's an accident. And I was in a lot of situations where I felt like I was being put on trial. And in some cases, the department heads did not do very much to help me. And I was like, I cannot believe that I have to sit here and justify my practice as a teacher. And the thing is, I was a model faculty member, okay? I, I didn't date my TAs. I didn't do inappropriate things with my students. And yet I'm the one having to defend myself to these male students, I mean, that really made me angry. And there was one student who made a gigantic drawing about how everything was my fault. And it started out saying, you, Clara, you are the one who has destroyed my inspiration and ability to be an artist. You and your stupid crap assignments, you have sucked the life out of me. And the, it was a huge drawing, it was like three feet tall, all handwritten, it went on and on and on and on. and. I, I was, wow, that was impressive. Deepti, any stories about sexual harassment in the workplace, anything like that, that you care no, to share? I mean, I mean obviously it's, it depends on the person. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think we all know a, a story or two, um, regardless of if it happened to us or somebody very close to us. But I think, you know, it, it, the, it runs the gambit like it could be a small comment that makes you feel uncomfortable um you know it doesn't have to be something as uh as brutal as it can be um but definitely uh it's it exists <laughs> it, it is there it is present and alive a hundred percent how about you lauren yeah i think um I've gone through my own fair share of maybe sexist situations. Um, definitely my professional career. Uh, being a student has its own range of experiences going from your freshman to senior year, which I definitely, I feel like I had that typical experience of. Um, I, I don't know if there's anything I would want to get into detail about, but I would say that yeah. I feel like my experience has been fairly typical to maybe other women in my programs. Serendipity says, I feel like artist creatives are always judged by their looks and how they present themselves. I'm overweight and 56, but creating means everything to me. Well, keep it going because we need people out there who don't fit what the 0.01% <laughs> that's represented oftentimes on Instagram. Sunset Stripes says, I feel that artists are among the few people who can appreciate faces that aren't quote conventionally beautiful because it's way more fun to paint diverse, interesting faces that stray from the status quo. I think it is, but just because something is interesting, it doesn't mean it gets visibility, unfortunately. So it can be pretty bad. And 
Let's see. Sorry, I missed this. Yeah, Brittany says the jerk professor of my school dated students. So I have a student who said to me, oh, I always sit like this when I have to have a critique with this professor. And she showed me her arms. She put her arms like crossed over her knees. I was like, why do you have to do that? She's like, oh, because he always touches the girls on the knees. And I don't want him to touch me there during the critique. Ew! Like, and these are people who had been tenured, people who had been around for decades. And I'm like, I'm an adjunct. I'm on my best behavior all the time. And I'm the one on trial. I'm the one being told I'm bullying students. And there are people doing this and nobody cares. It's like, really? That That's that's the standard for everybody? It's, it's really infuriating. Yeah. Intersol says, <laughs> any advice on how to deal with sexism? Deepti, any thoughts? Um, it's it's hard because I think it affects everybody differently. Um, like how also what what you're dealing with, but I think that you know first you know dealing with how it's affecting you is important. Finding someone to talk to, finding um, a community of people that support you is really important. But also I think I think just having conversations like these and talking about it and feeling empowered and finding ways to feel empowered and then also like empower others and start a chain reaction of like conversations and um, educating people and calling people out um, and speaking up is is um, is the best thing that you can do for yourself, I think, and for like the problem as a whole, in, in my opinion. We were talking about discrepancy in pay. And Deep D, I know that for you, a lot of the animators are now sharing how much they get paid so that people can know, oh my gosh, really? I should be charging that because we do so often charge less because we just have no idea what anybody else is charging. So that level of transparency has been huge for a lot of freelance artists getting started so they don't get screwed. Yeah, absolutely. That was that was amazing. Um, and it was so eye opening. And that's just a way that like, regardless of your gender or how you present, that's something that you can just, you know, do to make other people feel included and um, and getting what they what they deserve that was that was like a really cool thing that was happening and i hope happens way more um because it only empowers the people getting paid and only helps everyone as a whole <laughs> lauren any tips yeah I, you know i'm really not sure because i feel like i am maybe someone that is like falls into that category of being too nice or thinking maybe it's my fault, which is also, I'd have to say, something that happens a lot to uh, female identifying people is feeling like it is your fault for the way someone reacts towards you. But one thing that I'm trying to deal with right now is the expectation from mostly men, collectors, or people in my life, even friends, who think that my expect my prices to be less than than peers and colleagues that are at my level who like truly assume that and then kind of balk at that being the case and that is something that's been very painful for me especially when it happens like close to home and i guess that's something that i probably would have taken personally and lowered my prices if it wasn't for you know the people in my circle that said no stick with things so i agree with deep d that you have to really hold your own and create that network that that makes you feel supported and empowered we have an art prof share today art prof share is when we show you what our community is doing this is our drawing basics track and our track programs are sequences of video lessons and prompts that you can follow and the tracks are a lot of work. <laughs> we assign several weeks of lessons and prompts, and you can take a look at them on artprof.org. They're great if you don't know where to get started, but you know you want to improve on your skills. And so the Art Prof share today is Sarah McGill. And boy, did Sarah put a lot of work into this. Sarah says that I was motivated to do the drawing track, wanted to improve to express my ideas figuratively. I'm much more confident at drawing. The track was so fun with lots of options to play and obtain feedback. Looking forward to another. And I love this bullet list of lessons learned. If in doubt, make more thumbnails. Animal gestures and life drawing are my favorite practice go-to. Feedback was really helpful. 
And if I wasn't sure how to finish a piece, ask for feedback, leave it to percolate for a bit, thanks to the Discord community. So the first ongoing assignment is just to draw 10 minutes every day in your sketchbook, which is a lot harder than it sounds. <laughs> Deep T, why is this so hard to sustain? I mean, creating routines for anything is so difficult. I can't tell you the last time I drew, drew for 10 minutes in more than one day. Um, so this is so, so, so impressive. And also these are wonderful, very observant sketches. Like, um, you know, these aren't, any sketch for 10 minutes is amazing, but these are just, you know, so varied and, and um, you're trying out so many different things, which is incredible. Lauren, what do you think about these thumbnails? Ah! <laughs> Sarah, this is a joy to look at. I feel so inspired just looking at all of your thumbnails. And I am always the person that complains about having to do more thumbnails. Like I know that that thing that you said is right where when in doubt, make more thumbnails. My partner, Sam, tells me to make more thumbnails all the time and I don't do it. I look at your pieces and I say, yes, that is true. That is absolute truth. I, I The sketchbook is beautiful. And I'm so glad that you did this. Thank you. Look, Sarah is here with us live in the chat. Thank you so much for sharing your work with us, Sarah. And I, I just love this portrait because the lighting is just so luminous. I feel like the skin has this beautiful flushiness to it, but the hair has a lovely texture. And Sarah, you're such a versatile artist. I mean, it's like that same person that did that subtle, beautiful portrait also did these. I mean, the one on the left is almost like a nightmarish landscape. I don't really want to hang out in. And then this just sumptuous landscape. And so congratulations, Sarah, for finishing the track. We're so excited. And I hope to see more of you doing the tracks because it's just a great experience. Please join Deepti and I in the Discord. We are going to be doing a stage session. That is your opportunity to speak to us on voice, ask us your questions about anything. And remember, there are many ways you can support ArtProf. You can make a one-time donation. You can buy original artwork in our Etsy shop. And remember, we do have a podcast and to subscribe for more art tutorials, critiques, and business tips. And a thank you to our top Patreon supporters. Our newest supporters are Alyssa Heron and Amanda Norris. Thank you for joining because I want to hit that goal this year. I want this year to be the year that we hit that Patreon goal, everybody. And we have rewards and all kinds of exclusive content you can get as well. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next time.